<laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, so first of all, uh, apologies, because I did not reserve a large enough room. But um, so we're just going to get cozy. But I'm delighted to see so many of you. Um, this is the first uh, talk in a series uh, uh, dedicated to Shannon and Boole. Uh, as you may know, this year is the 200th uh, anniversary of uh, Boole's birth. And next year is the 100th anniversary of Shannon's birth. So we're celebrating the birthdays together. We're very fortunate to have today uh, Robert Gallagher. Uh, before I go and introduce him, I just want to mention that next month we'll have uh, Marc Mézard, the head of uh, L'École Normale Supérieure, who's going to give a talk. And the month after that, we're going to have Madhu Sudan. There will also be an event in March. Uh, this is being done jointly um, by MIT ECS, by MIT Physics, uh, RLE, and uh, University College Cork. We've been doing all of these together. Um, and uh, also on Tuesday at LSC, we have a, uh, a movie uh, about pool, which is going to be shown uh, in the evening. So if you're interested, please uh, do come. And with that, I'm very happy today uh, to introduce Bob Gallagher. Um, and Bob is a member of National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Engineering. You've got lots and lots of awards. And he's going to talk really well. So thank you for coming, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I was also just elected a member of the National Academy of Idiotic Children. So I feel very, <laughs> so I feel very proud. Uh, what? <laughs> sure. <laughs> but you have to prove your idiocy. It's, uh, OK. Uh, I want to talk about both George Boole and Claude Shannon today, but I'll be talking mostly about Claude Shannon uh, because, old as I am, I didn't quite overlap with George Boole. Uh, <laughs> he was, um, uh, he unfortunately died at the age of 49, uh, which is, uh, and he did quite a bit before that, so that's pretty remarkable. So I think he's a pretty fantastic person. But the only thing I know about him is what I read about him. Uh, and I knew Claude Shannon pretty well. I've spent my whole life, essentially, trying to understand what it was that made Shannon do so many extraordinarily effective things. He was very, very smart, and that helped. But there was more than that. Uh, and that's basically what I want to talk about today. Whoops. Uh, so Boole. Uh, is famous for Boolean algebra, of course, which is also called Boolean logic. Uh, what he did, I mean, logic has been understood basically since the time of Aristotle and probably for a long time before that. Uh, but logic was always applied with natural language. Uh, and Boole figured out a way to do it in equations, uh, which makes all of us as engineers and mathematicians and scientists all very delighted because here was a member of our group, essentially, who said you can do this with equations, too. If you think about it a little bit and you think about the way logic is actually used, you think, ah, this is really very important. Uh, because if you listen, for example, to the Republican debates, uh, you hear, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about politics, no. I, I, have, I, have, I have sworn I won't do that. Uh, but, but if you listen to them, what you find is not the examples you always find in a philosophy class uh, of bad logic. Uh, because those examples are things which say good logic is, is uh, uh, Socrates was a philosopher. Philosophers are men. Uh, therefore, Socrates was a man. Uh, very sexist, but that's the usual example given. And then if you say it the other way around, uh, Socrates was a man, and Socrates was a philosopher, and therefore all philosophers are men, uh, that's bad logic. The trouble with using logic in natural language is people make statements uh, to form a syllogism, all of which are very fuzzy, and they make them uh, not in order to find the truth themselves,
but they make them in order to sell what they have decided is the truth by completely other means. Uh, and because of that, logic doesn't work in those other fields. It's not, it's not because of the lack of equations. Uh, the lack of equations uh, simply makes it a little harder to do. So, but but the, the advantage of what Boole did was he suddenly stripped Boolean logic away from all of these bad uses of logic, and he found nice ways of doing it. And as I say there, logic continues to be abused in politics, religion, and most non-scientific areas, and it's deliberately misused. It's misused because people want to give speeches, they want to convince other people of something, uh, and of course they're going to use whatever technique works for them. Uh, and uh, most of us as scientists feel that's very unfortunate, but that's the way it is, so, uh, so we live with it. Okay, Claude Shannon also, of course, uh, created information theory, and that was his really major work. Uh, it was a stunning piece of work. It was something which people were just startled by. Uh, I mean, for a very long time, uh, people in many walks of life thought, gee, this really is a fantastic piece of intellectual work. Uh, this will be used to help linguists understand their field. It will, be help, it will help philosophers to understand what information is. Shannon's theory, which got called information theory, has very little to do with information. It really has to do with data. And it has to do with how engineers deal with data. And it's a marvelous thing because of the way it does that. Uh, but if you think this is the way to deal with information, I don't think anybody has any idea how to deal with information at this point. We try to do our best with it, uh, or we try to misuse it for our own ends. But, but that's, not, uh, that's not what's going to help us too much. OK, would, uh, uh, question, would modern communication technology and computer technology and their synthesis, which have all happened in the last 50 years, would they have developed as quickly and in the same way without Shannon and Boole? Uh, I really don't know. It's a, it, it's a very hard question. If you look at history the way, it's in, the way it has evolved, clearly Shannon had a major part to do with it. The fact that Boole uh, taught us how to, how to do logic with equations had a major amount to do with it. Uh, if they hadn't done it, would somebody else have done it? Anybody's guess. My guess is uh, if, if Shannon had started to try to understand switching theory uh, without Boolean logic, he would probably have, inven have invented Boolean logic uh, because that's the kind of person he was. Uh, so that I, th I, I think that Boolean logic would have been invented in, in any case. It's rather startling that people didn't use it very much for 100 years until Shannon came along. So, so Boole, in fact, did have a great deal to do with all of this, and it was kind of, kind of amazing uh, what he did. Uh, I can't really guess what those things are about. I'm not a historian. I'm not a person who was going to write the history uh, of, what, uh, of who really invented the information age. And I, I find such questions crazy uh, because there were so many people involved in so many different parts of this crazy world we live in right now that, that I don't want to blame it on anyone. I don't want to give anyone credit for it. Uh, what I do want to understand is what was it that made people like Boole and Shannon so enormously creative. Uh, and that's the whole thing that I'm trying to sort out. Uh, and one thing that I just saw a short time ago was Claude Shannon gave a talk entitled Creative Thinking back in 1952 uh, to a small group of researchers, I presume at the theoretical research group at Bell Labs. Uh, and uh, he told people how to do research. Uh, well, of course, it didn't get reported at all because most people think, most people who do research think they know how to do research. Uh, and most of them do to a certain extent. Uh, some of us sometimes 
can say, well, I know how to do research, but maybe I can do it a little better uh, if I learn some of the tricks that other people use. So what kind of tricks was it that Shannon was using? He called them tricks. Uh, I mean, to me, they were much more than tricks. But he started out with three things that he thought were, um, excuse me, take me a little while uh, uh, to get used to this. He started out with three things that he thought every researcher had to know uh, in order to be a capable researcher. And there's not much surprise in any of them, uh, except the way he stated them. Uh, and I want to talk about this a little bit because, because what I'm trying to do is to take this short talk that he gave, uh, uh, try to make sense of it, especially for someone back then who came from a very different culture. Uh, I mean, our culture has changed enormously in the last uh, 60 years or so. Uh, everybody does things in a totally different way than they did before. Uh, words mean different things now. Uh, when he talked about training and experience, I was a little put off by that because to me you don't train researchers, you train dogs to stand on their hind legs and things like that. Uh, but you help researchers learn to do research. Uh, but then I thought about it a little more and said, no, Shannon was right. Uh, if he said helping people learn to do research, uh, everybody would say, what do you mean by learning? Uh, and he didn't, he didn't really mean learning here. All he meant was that people had somehow picked up enough tricks uh, about uh, research. They picked up enough knowledge. They had, they had done the things that students are supposed to do uh, along with learning, along with becoming educated. You just have to learn a lot of things. You have to learn a lot of facts. They're boring. Uh, you don't like to deal with them, but you have to learn what other people know. Uh, if you want to talk to other people, you have to get all this background. And that's what he meant when, by training, I think. Uh, he didn't mean one person training another person. Uh, what I think he really meant was, uh, was people acquiring the, the background, the, the stuff that's no fun that they need. Then he said you need intelligence. Uh, and he was just pointing out that if you have an IQ of 90, uh, you'd probably better look for some field other than creative thinking. You're probably not going to be very successful there. If you were successful there, you wouldn't be able to talk anybody into believing what you had done. Uh, so you need those two things. Motivation, he spent a long time trying to explain that because he clearly didn't mean what most of us think of as motivation. Of course, you need motivation to do anything. Uh, but he was talking about a kind of intellectual motivation. He was talking about the inner drive to formulate questions and find answers. Claude was really into questioning and answering things. He, was, he would probe on all sides of a problem. Uh, he would not do what students do. When I was teaching here, I was always amazed at the enormous number of students who, when you give them a problem to do, will fill 10 pages with equations. And if they're lucky, they'll come out with the right answer and realize that one of the equations is the right answer. And if they're not, they won't. But they'll never make a mistake. And if I write one page of equations, I'll make 10 mistakes. Uh, but at least I ask myself on each question, Does this, uh, uh, is this equation leading me any place? Uh, and students today are so fast and so facile and so well trained uh, that they can just blast through anything uh, without without really getting any place because there's so many different ways to go uh, and you have to somehow sort out what the right way is. So, so he was talking about this inner drive of formulating and finding answers, talking about curiosity, about fundamental characteristics of things. He, didn't, he wasn't interested in the details. He was interested really in what made things tick, which was the way he often put it. Uh, there was a need to understand in multiple ways. Uh, there was a need to get, uh, oh, and the other thing that he pointed out was just a natural part of this that, that all of us who ever try to do anything academic have found out for ourselves 
there's an enormous satisfaction that comes uh, when you finally understand something you've been fighting with for three or four days. There's just this wonderful, aha, I finally see it. Uh, and it really feels good. And he was just telling people that, that yeah, it, if it doesn't feel good to you, then you shouldn't be doing it. So he had all of these things which were, I think, sort of important, but not, not really unusual. But then he said he had a number of tricks which he often found useful. Now, to me, when I looked at the tricks he was talking about, I said, gee, those aren't tricks. Those are the basic principles of how to do research. So I want to share them with you. Uh, and uh, maybe you'll agree with them or not. Uh, uh, the first of them was simplification. You really have to get rid of enough detail, including practical aspects of the problem. Uh, for intuitive understanding. Uh, the first time I ever talked to Shannon, I'd been screwing up my courage to go in and talk to him when I was a young assistant professor for a long time. I was, I was working on what I thought was a very fascinating problem. It was important. Uh, it was also fun. It was fascinating. I thought, gee, this is, this is the best thing I've done for a long time. So I went and talked to him. He looked very puzzled. He was trying to understand. He was trying to be polite. Uh, and then he kept saying, well, I don't quite understand what this is all about. Uh, is there some way we can simplify it a little bit? So we, so we talked back and forth, and finally we, got, finally we got rid of the most important practical aspect of the problem, uh, and I felt a little bad. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we got rid of the next most practical aspect of the problem. Uh, and after that, we got rid of the most important theoretical aspect of the problem. Uh, and I was just feeling <laughs> terrible. Uh, but then after two or three more steps, we got down to something where both of us saw what the obvious answer was. Uh, I saw it because I'd been working on it for so long. He saw it because he was just smarter than any, anybody else I've known. Uh, and amazingly, putting the pieces back, the problem was solved. Uh, and I've never forgotten that. It was. Uh, uh, and I've tried to do it myself. It works an enormous amount of the time. But what were his, his other tricks? He would find it was similar to a known problem. Experience helps in doing that. I think, I think most of you uh, figure out how to do that pretty quickly on your own. There's not much surprise about that. It's, a, uh, it's something. And I'm going to go through an example of some of his research in which he, he did all of these things. Uh, the third one was he said, you got to reformulate the problem very often. You got to avoid getting in a rut. Uh, and he, he had the sense that uh, for most people, including him, when he worked on a problem for a while, pretty soon it was like a broken record. You know, it would go back and back and back. It would keep, it would keep going as far as he could go up to this wall. And he just memorized all the steps in the argument. So that obviously, each time he did it, he would get up to the same wall. And he said, when that happens, just stop, forget all of that, and do something entirely different. Look for a totally different way to look at the problem. Uh, so he, that's pretty important, too. Uh, then he said, generalize. And that's much more important than, well, it's, it's much more significant and much more general uh, than just generalizing from where you simplify. I mean, sometimes you start out with this problem, you simplify it down to this problem, and then off you go generalizing it off there with something you never thought about before, uh, which turns out to be more important than the thing you were working on to start with. Uh, then another thing was structural analysis, which is break the problem into pieces. This sounds a little like the simplification, but the simplification is not breaking it into pieces. The simplification is just getting rid of most of the problem and just saying, let's think of a little sub-problem we might make some progress on. Uh, and then finally, inversion, and this is something we all do. Uh, you work back from what you think the answer ought to be. Uh, now, you might think that's unscientific, uh, and it is a little unscientific because scientists are supposed to look for the truth. They're not supposed to assume the truth. But uh, all of us do assume the truth. We all say, I think the answer ought to be this. It's, it's amazing any time you talk to the, the most formal mathematicians in the world, Russian mathematicians, 
uh, Hungarian mathematicians, all of them. Uh, they will prove theorems with this enormous carefulness. Everything is done very precisely. Uh, but then when you talk to them, they will come out after a while with, well, the answer ought to be something like this. Uh, and that's the way they think. It's not the way they prove theorems. It's the way they think. It's the way all of us think. I, I, I believe it's the only way one can think. If one doesn't do that, one is not going to make any progress. If one, if one only makes statements one is sure of, uh, then you're sort of defeated from the beginning. OK, so, so inversion was starting at the end and working back and seeing, what's, and seeing what has to be true to make what you want to be true be true. OK, so that's, uh, there were some other tricks that Shannon didn't talk about there, uh, which I've sort of discovered from uh, questioning what he was doing all the time by reading his papers and saying, well, how did he come up with this? Uh, and one of the most useful, according to my view of it, is be interested in several interesting problems at all times. Uh, namely, instead of just giving up and working intensely on one problem, have 10 problems in the back of your mind. Uh, be thinking about them, be reading things about them, wake up in the morning, uh, and sort of review whether there's anything interesting about any of them. Uh, and, uh, and invariably, when you're asking questions and trying to do what you're trying to do, one of them will pop to the fore. And it's usually one where you read something about it the day before, or you talked to somebody about it, or you read something in the newspaper, or you, just some peculiar synapse went off in your brain when you were sleeping. God knows what. Uh, doesn't make any difference. Uh, something triggers one of those problems and you start working on it. Now, why is that so important? Well, I've always found that one of the most difficult things in trying to do research is how do you give up on a problem? So many students doing a thesis just beat themselves over the head for year after year after year, saying, I've got to finish this problem. I said I was going to do it. And I'm going to do it. Well, if, if it's an experiment you're going to do, uh, yes, you can do that. You can do it more and more carefully if something isn't working. You fix it to the point where it works. Uh, if you're trying to prove some theorem, and the theorem happens to be not true, uh, <laughs> then, then your chances of success are very low. <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, now, if you have these 10 problems in the back of your mind, and there's this one problem that's been driving you crazy, what are you going to do? It's going to sink further and further back in your mind. And just because you have more interesting things to do, uh, you've gotten away from it. After a year, you won't even remember you were working on it. It will have disappeared. That's a far better thing than to reason it out and say, well, I don't think I can go any further with this because of this, this, and this reason. Because your problem is you don't understand the problem to start with, which is why you have to give up on it. But you don't understand it well enough to understand why you want to give up on it. So you just find that you can do other things which become more interesting temporarily. You look for contradictions as well as proof. When you're trying to prove a theorem, uh, you think you've made a little progress. You think you've gotten some insight on it. Uh, don't. Don't spend more than an hour being happy about it and telling all your friends about it. Go back and say, OK, I'm going to, I mean, for me, it was, I'm going to be my father. I'm going to find something wrong with this. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and you know, all of us have somebody we can point to, a professor we hated, uh, or uh, uh, I mean, every one of us has, has somebody they can think of. But the point is, when you think you understand something, blast as many holes in it as you can, because then you'll understand it a whole lot better. OK, study what's happening in multiple fields, but don't work on what many others are working on. Uh, if you're working on what problems that other people are working on, make your chances of success much smaller. It also means that you have to work very fast. And for somebody like Claude Shannon, he didn't like to work fast. He liked to work at his own pace. Uh, which was the kind of pace that led to fantastic results. If he had to, had to do it in a hurry, he just wanted to 
I don't think he'd have managed with that. There's another advantage to that. Uh, and there's also a disadvantage to it. If you work in a field that a very large number of other people are working on, uh, and you keep publishing little results in that field, pretty soon, since the field is very large, you work with 10 other people. Uh, so you're publishing lots of papers. Uh, you have 10 authors on each of these papers. Uh, and therefore, you build up a tremendous uh, list of things you've done. And there are still places who count how many papers you've printed and you've published and say that must be, have some effect on how good you are as a researcher. Well, I certainly believe it has a lot of effect on, it's very highly correlated with how good a researcher you are. The more papers you publish every year, the poorer a researcher you, you're, uh, uh, you almost have to be. Uh, good researchers uh, maybe do one really good paper in their lives. Uh, Shannon, uh, if you took away all the nice little things he did and you leave him with only his switching paper and his communication paper, he would still probably be the greatest uh, engineer we have seen in the last 100 years. Uh, I mean, you can quarrel with that, but, but the point is he was one of the great ones on the basis of two papers. If you throw out the switching, uh, maybe you might think he was only one of the two best or something. Just on the basis, just on the basis of that one paper, he was a fantastic researcher. And that one paper took him about, about seven years to do it. Uh, and if you look at his entire published output, it wasn't all that high. OK, so ask conceptual questions about everyday things, which is what he was doing all the time. Uh, he was not too busy uh, to look at something strange and say, gee, that's sort of interesting. He loved to build things. Uh, and because he loved to build things, he would go back and forth between thinking about them and building them. Uh, don't assume. Uh, don't write papers unless you really want to share something fascinating. Uh, this, again, has to do with the overpublishing business. Uh, don't assume your readers know everything you do. Uh, spoon feeding uh, really is not a bad idea. It's, it, it's hard enough to get your ideas across uh, that if you do what you think is spoon feeding, you're probably going to keep people with you for an awful lot longer than you would otherwise. OK, so let's go through a quick biography of him. You have to do that when you're talking about him. I'd just as soon skip it, but uh, I feel I ought to. Uh, he was a nerd, uh, and he was, uh, he was normal but, and bright, uh, but yet a nerd. Well, of course he was a nerd. I mean, he was one of the greatest researchers of the 20th century. You'd think he was an athlete in high school or something. <laughs> Um, well, and because of this, he graduated from high school at the age of 16. Uh, so, so he was showing some, some signs of being bright. Uh, and it wasn't because he was speeding through. It was just because he, he did things uh, well. Uh, he got a double degree at the University of Michigan uh, in math and electrical engineering uh, at age 20. So he was. He was a little ahead of the pack at this point, but that's not fantastic. Uh, he, he didn't know what to do at that point, but he saw an ad for a research assistant to take care of, uh, of the differential analyzer at MIT, which was, which was probably the, about the best computer around at that time. I mean, I mean this was 1938, uh, 1936, I believe. So there wasn't much computation around. But he thought that would be cool. Uh, and you know, Vannevar Bush, uh, he, was, he was not like the rest of the Bush clan. In fact, he wasn't even a part of the Bush clan. <laughs> he was, I mean, he was a highly respected scientist. Uh, and, he, uh, and, and, and he operated at a very broad level. Uh, so uh, I don't think Shannon was thinking about this, but, but you know, if you have somebody like that on your side, uh, and you want to spend a few years doing something odd, uh, you can probably get away with doing it. Uh, you don't have to worry about the things that most researchers have to worry about, because you have a, have a very powerful person in your corner. Uh, 
But what this did is he got interested in all the switching that was involved with that differential analyzer. Yes, yes, it was a continuous time kind of thing and all these things that went buzzing around continuously. But there was a lot of switching to control what went on. And he got interested in how the switching worked. Uh, he'd taken a course in Boolean algebra at Michigan. So I was lying when I told you there was no interest in it at all. There was, there was some interest, but, a, but, but it was not a huge field. Uh, but he understood it a little bit. Uh, and from that, uh, he started getting interested in switching. He wrote his master's thesis. <coughs> and his master's thesis created, <coughs> created a new field. He won an award for it for the best engineering paper for somebody under 30. <coughs> but many people looked at that paper and they said, this is, this is the most important master's thesis ever written. So <coughs> and I don't know about that, but it was, certainly, <coughs> it was certainly a very significant piece of work. Uh, and it did start a new field. And it made him relatively famous. It got him a job at Bell Labs. Uh, and it got him a job where, where people uh, uh, really respected him. So he was on his way. <clears throat> his PhD thesis was in algebra theoretical genetics. Uh, the results were very good, uh, but he never bothered to publish it. Uh, now, why didn't he bother to publish it? Uh, I mean, for you guys, for the most part, if you didn't publish your PhD thesis, it would be suicide, in a way, for your career. But remember, he was famous already. <laughs> if, you're, if you're famous already, you don't have to do any more. You can just sit back on your laurels, uh, and you can do an interesting thesis and not publish. Oh, thank you so much. That's great. <laughs> mm. OK. so. So he could sit back in his laurels, but also he was interested in other things. He, he had this business of, he had all these things he was interested in. And the one he was interested in currently was not genetics. It was, uh, I mean, it was a good, good PhD thesis, but it was, not, uh, it was not the thing that was most interesting to him. So he just put it aside and forgot about it. And it sunk down into the sand of his, of his head uh, and that was the end of it. Uh, so he started working in telecommunication. Uh, he worked at, the, uh, at Princeton's Advanced Study Institute uh, for about a year. He was, was that what? Saying that the Institute for Advanced Studies, or was that different? No, no. Uh, what did I say? Uh, Princeton's, uh, oh, oh, yes. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. No. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, uh, and he only worked at places like that. <laughs> I mean, after he worked there, he was Bell Labs, then MIT. And uh, that's the only time when I've ever thought that maybe somebody took a step down when he came to MIT. It's, uh, but uh, <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, he was, no. OK. During the war, he worked on fire control. He worked on cryptography. The funny story about cryptography, he wasn't cleared uh, to work on it. Uh, so he, he talked to the people who were doing it, uh, including Turing, who was doing a lot of the cryptography work then. But he couldn't tell them. Uh, I mean, he could tell them everything he knew, but they couldn't tell him what they knew. But anyway, he developed this mathematical theory of cryptography uh, fairly early during the war. Uh, he didn't publish it until the end of the war because it was classified until then. Many people thought that led to his theory of communication. Uh, most people who have looked into it more and have asked him and have asked his wife and asked other people uh, are pretty convinced uh, that it was the other way around. He just wasn't ready to talk about communication at that point because all the pieces had not come together. Uh, and cryptography at the level that he was interested in uh, was, a, uh, was, uh, was really a simpler problem. Uh, so uh, that was just what he was doing. Uh, 1948, everything came together for his mathematical theory of communication. 
he wrote it, uh, republished it a little bit later, uh, and then it was the theory, the mathematical theory of communication, of course. Uh, and I do want to talk to you a little bit about one part of that theory. Uh, I think probably half of you in the room know as much about it as I do, uh, and the other half uh, probably don't know anything about it and probably are not that interested in it. I want to talk to you about it because it's a beautiful example of how he did research, of how he used all these principles that he knows about, uh, and which, uh, unfortunately, this set of principles, which, which I view as the, as the main principles for doing intellectual research, are never talked about in school. You never hear about it in grade school. You should hear about it then. You never hear about it in high school. You never hear about it in college. Graduate students never hear about it, except you. you uh, you're very lucky because you're now learning something that has been hidden for a long, long time. And I'm, and I'm trying to make it known at this point. OK, so uh, in, uh, in this theory, sources are characterized by the bit rate per symbol or per second needed to reproduce the source exactly or within a given distortion measure. Uh, channels can be characterized by an essentially error-free bit rate called capacity. You all know that. The third part of it, which is not as well publicized, but which could be more important, is there's a standard binary interface uh, these days between sources and channels. Uh, almost everything, for a very large number of reasons, almost all sources are turned into bits. Uh, and what you put into channels are bits which you've encoded. You don't, you don't go directly from a source to a channel. You always go to this interface. Uh, and you know, every time you used to talk to somebody about communication, they would say, how much bandwidth are you using to send your messages? You never hear that anymore. Or you rarely hear it. Uh, people say, what bit rate are you sending? And people talk about sources. And they say, what's the bit rate of the source? OK, so, so bit rate has really taken over. People believe in this now. Uh, and that's, uh, that's partly what he did. I'm going to let you read this. You can probably read it three times as fast as I can say it, uh, because this is what he said to start to motivate uh, the work that he was doing. And I wanted to put it up here because uh, it's beautiful language. Uh, and it is uh, just an amazing, if you think about it for a long time, you won't think of anything he's left out. He's put it all in there, all very compactly. Also, it looks nice, uh, but it's all there. OK, so that's, that's your last chance to read it. I hope you're all speed readers. I'm going to talk about the source representation that he did, uh, mostly just to talk about how he did this. Uh, how he did this business of simplifying. Uh, oops. OK, so let's, let's be a little technical now. Uh, P of i is going to be the probability of the letter i. Uh, it's the probability of an independent, identically distributed uh, letter uh, sequence, uh, which is x1, x2, x3, x4. So what we're starting with is English text, for example. And we're trying to say, what's the probability that a particular sequence of English text is going to appear? And Shannon said, interestingly enough, uh, the letters are all independent of each other. Why did he assume that? It was to simplify the problem. And he had thrown out uh, all the practical parts of it. He would thrown out all the linguistic parts of the problem. He kept the part that uh, it was used in Morse code, for example, uh, it was recognized that E was the most likely letter in the alphabet. And therefore, if you were trying to encode things, you would make E a single dot. But then he did something very brilliant. Everybody else that had looked at the problem had looked at Morse code. Uh, and after looking at Morse code and being partly mathematicians, partly engineers, they wrote a difference equation to represent the fact that, that you were making letters of unequal length with un, un, unequal spaces and all sorts of little details like that. And people, 
And, and you know, it was an easy difference equation to solve, quite straightforward, and they would solve it. But where did they go then? You see, other people would make the simplification, but they make a simplification in a way, I mean, they throw away the practical part of the problem, but they also throw away the ability to generalize the problem in any way. I mean, you probably could have generalized it in some way, but it would have been very difficult and nobody did. He did it this way. Uh, uh, and, whoops, back again. So the probability of Shannon uh, would be probability of a capital S, probability of H, probability of A, and so forth. Uh, which, and since he was assuming these letters were IID, uh, what he had was uh, P of N cubed, because there were three Ns, P of capital S, P of H, P of A, and P of O. Uh, okay, fine, that's very simple. And then he said, well, what happens if you have a million letters? Uh, because in telecommunication, you know, you're transmitting letters all the time. Uh, and back then, a lot of what you wanted to transmit was English text or, or French text or what have you. Uh, and then he said, well, from the law of large numbers, typical sequences uh, where the sequences are very long are going to have about, length is tau, they're going to have about tau times the probability of i, appearances of letter i for each i. Okay. So first thing he's done here is to make quite a remarkable simplification of the problem where he really threw away what looks like the whole problem. And then he used similarity in a sense to say, I know about the law of large numbers. I'm a probabilist after all. Uh, and if I make these sequences very long, maybe I'll find out something by, by using the law of large numbers. Uh, so he wrote it down. The probability of a very long sequence is going to be the product over the letters in the alphabet of the probability that is assumed for that letter times the number of that letter, tau times p sub i. Now, I'm cheating you all, uh, and those of you who work with the law of large numbers know that I'm leaving out a, sm a few small things. But, but, but this is essentially what you have. And then he said, well, how do I deal with this product? Uh, and he knew very well that when you deal with sums of things, you can use the law of large numbers. And so he converted this to 2 to the length of the sequence times the sum of pi uh, times the logarithm of p of i. And he said, gee, that looks like an interesting formula. Uh, and he said, it looks like the entropy in physics. The fact that it happened to be the, the entropy in physics was totally irrelevant here. Uh, and a lot of physicists got very interested in this. And they, and they said, aha, I can be on the wave of the future because I'm one of those one person out of 10,000 who studied thermodynamics and understood what entropy was. Uh, and uh, uh, I wish I had understood en entropy when I was studying physics, but I never did. Uh, but this seemed like a very simple idea. But anyway, here it was. Uh, it was very straightforward. And then he realized that all typical sequences have about the same probability. Uh, cumulatively, their probability is 1. Therefore, there have to be about 2 to the length times h of p typical sequences. And by this time, he was home because he realized that if you have a very large number of sequences and you want to represent them with binary digits, uh, you take this many, an alphabet this large, and it takes tau times h of p binary digits to represent it. So you're taking h of p binary digits per letter. OK, the reason I'm going through this and the reason I'm leaving out a lot of details is because the argument is really very, very simple. Uh, any, any good graduate student, if you give them this problem and you spell out what they're supposed to do well enough, they're going to solve it. OK, so this was one of the things that made him famous. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things is his channel coding theorem it was just an extension of this. It was just a generalization. So there you have generalization put in also. He was using all of his tricks. Uh, and by using all of his tricks, this theory, instead of being very complicated as people thought it was, 
Physicists were trying to explain this entropy, which is trivial, in terms of thermodynamic entropy, or, uh, or quantum entropy even, which is very difficult. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's what Shannon did. It was simple, uh, and he used all of his tricks. Um, now, after he did that, he started to generalize it again. He said, well, the same argument will work if I take a Markov chain and I study the probabilities of digrams. I can study the probability of trigrams. I can then go on and study the probability of words. I can use digrams of words. And you read his paper and his, and his insight into how to do that, how to calculate those, those probabilities experimentally. I mean, it's just a thing of beauty. But there's nothing extremely special about it. It's something that any bright person would think of after a while. Uh, OK, so let me just, uh, I'm going to skip this and just comment at the end that Shannon's work was brilliantly simple and simply brilliant. Uh, why? Not because there was anything complicated about it, because he knew these tricks and he knew how to use them. Uh, and it all turned into something terribly important. OK, the typical sequence arguments he used work for channels also. Uh, he used the same approach. And uh, he did have to go to a, a real trick, not one of these principles, but, uh, but the idea of using randomly chosen codes. And how he came up with that, I don't think anybody has ever figured out. Uh, this was just his pure genius that was coming out at that point. OK, but he always found the right way to look at problems. He always built things to study problems. He wrote technical papers to study them. If you think about what he did, every problem he looked at, he really found what really seemed to be the nicest way of looking at them. Um, he was the opposite of an applied mathematician. Many people try to become applied mathematicians thinking, thinking that's a good way to apply mathematics to engineering problems. He was the opposite of that. His trick was in finding the right models to look at problems. Uh, applied mathematicians solve other people's models. Now that's an important thing to learn how to do, but that's not what's really important here. Uh, his business was finding the models. And it was also solving the models because it was through solving the models that he got the insight about it. OK, so let's go on to Boole. I don't want to forget him. Uh, but I'm, uh, except I'm going to be fairly brief on the biography. He was the son of a cobbler. The cobbler was more interested in mathematics uh, and optics than he was in cobbling. Uh, and uh, Boole was brought up. Uh, about 120 miles north of, oops, where am I? Oh, OK. Um, he was about 120 miles north of London. He was really self-taught. Uh, he stopped school very early. He started teaching school. And in those days, that happened, day schools and boarding schools. There wasn't uh, education that everybody had to do. Incidentally, this is his 200th anniversary, and it is Shannon's 99th anniversary, uh, 100 minus 1. Who cares about the 1? Uh, and, and he didn't know anything, but he taught himself everything that he learned. The schools he were in had pretty good libraries. Uh, so he started writing mathematics papers. Uh, and they kept getting rejected, except a kindly editor looked at it and said there was some promise there and helped him learn how to write papers. Uh, he wrote a paper in 1944 on symbolic algebra. Symbolic algebra, what? 1844. What? 1844. Did I say 1944? Oh, well, it's uh, <laughs> 1744. <laughs> he was very precocious. <laughs> uh, you know, symbolic algebra is this business of uh, of taking symbols like differentiation, integration, things like that, and treating them like algebraic symbols. And, it's, and it works sometimes. And he, uh, he made some real progress on that problem. 
and he got a Royal Medal from the Royal Society in 1944 uh, for his paper on that. And after that, his career was made. Uh, so he was lucky, like Shannon. Uh, after, you're, after you're famous, you can write papers and they get published. Uh, because, because the way the world works, and especially today, nobody has time to really review papers carefully. Sad thing, but that's, that's the way it is. Uh, if everybody writes 50 papers a year, uh, and everybody reads, carefully reads 50 papers a year, it means that the average number of people who read your papers is going to be one. There are three reviewers, which means that all you would hope for is to have one of the three reviewers read your paper, and the rest of them will read the abstract and say something stupid. Uh, <laughs> okay, but, but you know, at this point, Bull, Bull had it made, uh, so, he, uh, so he started to do things that were really interesting to him. Uh, his mathematical analysis of logic, first one came out in 1847, uh, and uh, he was very young then still. Um, oh, wait a minute. Uh, and then he was appointed as the professor of mathematics at the university, uh, at the uh, uh, at University College in Cork. That was not the name then. Uh, but this was very unusual. He didn't have a high school degree. He certainly didn't have a college degree. He certainly never got an, a doctorate or anything like that. And yet he was a professor in mathematics at a, at a reputable school. Great. Uh, why? Uh, because he won this award. He'd done one paper and done it really well. Uh, so. Everybody said that trumps everything else. He's, uh, he must be one of us. Uh, he must be better than us. Uh, OK. Um, so what he'd done with his reduction to equations and his uh, Boolean logic was something which then became famous for the short term. His many papers were not all that famous. He did some work in probability. But it really didn't last at all, and it was uh, a long time before all of the paradoxes and probability got worked out. Uh, OK, Sh similarities between Shannon and Boole. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to finish by 5 o'clock, and I have four minutes to go. So uh, the speed will have to go up a little bit, because I have some things I really want to say. Uh, both of them were recognized when they were very young. Uh, Shannon. Uh, wrote this fantastic paper on switching when he was 22. What have you guys all been doing? <laughs> Better question, what have I been doing? Uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, Bull was a little older. Uh, but Bull had a few handicaps because he didn't have any schooling. Uh, magnum opus of each one opened up a new field. Each one spent about eight years on their magnum opus, Shannon on mathematical theory of communication, Boole on logic. Uh, their magnum opus was really quite simple in retrospect. I mean, it's something you can describe in five or 10 minutes. Uh, and you really have most of it at that point. Uh, Boole's research appears to indicate that he really understood Shannon's tricks of creative research. I mean, many people throughout history have understood these rules. Uh, just Shannon happened to, as a by thought one day, uh, gave a seminar where he, where he let it out, what he was doing. Uh, and uh, that was nice. I want to talk a little bit about simplification, because that's sort of the, sort of the main trick that he used, and it's the most important of them. Uh, what is simplification? What do we mean by it? And there are a lot of quotes around uh, about simplification. If you look up on Wikipedia, uh, you'll find pages and pages and pages of them. And most of them sort of say it's all right to be a simpleton. Uh, and, and they say you don't have to do any more than that. Uh, that wasn't what Shannon meant at all. Um, Weinberg had an interesting commentary on it. He said, in the study of anything outside human affairs, and I don't know why he left out human affairs, uh, <laughs> in, including the study of complexity, which a lot of us are interested in, it is only simplicity that can be interesting. And the point he was trying to make is 
Until it becomes simple, you don't understand it. You can't reason with it. It's not part of your system. It's something complicated out there. Uh, Einstein uh, usually uh, said things right, uh, but I think this was, this was his biggest mistake, I think, uh, aside from his saying that God doesn't roll dice, uh, which, which probably held back probability theory for a long time. <laughs> uh, uh, but Einstein said everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Well, of course. But what does that mean? How do you tell? <laughs> uh, I, and so, so you're really puzzled by it. Alfred North Whitehead, I don't know whether you've heard of Whitehead or not. Uh, he was a philosopher in England. He was a co-author with Bertrand Russell uh, of the principles. Uh, I forget what it was. I forget what it was called then. It was their effort to take all of human knowledge and compress it into one big, very heavy volume. Principia Mathematica, I think. Principia Mathematica, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so he was a well-respected person. He was a big deal. Uh, and his, his explanation of it was uh, search for simplicity but mistrust it. And that, I think, uh, I think it really is a home run. Uh, and I want to explain it, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, searching for simplicity is really searching for an intuitive understanding of something. It's, it's, it's searching for something you can put into your own system of thought of the kinds of things that pop into the foreground uh, often and easily. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't, uh, well, and, and, and the mistrust that he advocates that goes along with it, uh, I can't separate the, okay. Um, mistrusting means that after you've simplified something, after you've put it into your, your web of ideas that you can understand all the time, what he said at that point was, Knock it down. Mistrust it. Find out what's wrong with it. Because that's the way you learn, by first building something up, by making it common sense to yourself, and then finding out what its limitations are, finding out where it's weak. Uh, so uh, that was what he did. Uh, and uh, he went back and forth, according to Whitehead, between uh, searching for simplicity and then knocking holes in it. Uh, and then hopefully generalize an alternative simplification. The search and mistrust really leads to a process of successive probing. Uh, you vary the simplification, you generalize, you reformulate, you do all of these things. Each step, you learn something new, and as you learn something new, you keep adding to the whole thing until eventually you've made sense out of the whole business. Uh, Shannon was a grand master of all of that. Uh, None of the rest of us are grandmasters, but my contention is all of us can practice these things. We can all try to do these things. Uh, I've, I'm not a very smart person, but I've tried doing these things after Shannon taught me how to do it. Uh, and you know, it works pretty well. Uh, perhaps we might even teach our students about creative research instead of pushing them to program more and more complex problems. Computational resources let us solve incredibly complex problems. But do we learn anything? I don't know. So graduate students may take simplicity for triviality. They then complicate it. Misconception, it takes the best students to, uh, well, people think that it takes the best students to solve the most complex problems. It really takes the best students to find the most simple open problems. And perhaps if we, if all of us try to use Shannon's tricks a little more, we will all be better at creative thinking and we'll all have more fun in life. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Bob. We, we only have a couple minutes for questions, and then we shall whisk Bob upstairs 
uh, building 36, six floors so that uh, everybody can enjoy the um, reception and he doesn't get uh, um, bogged down here for the next hour. Um, so maybe if we have a couple of questions. Yes. <coughs> Interested in the coding uh, he, he was mildly interested in it. Uh, he was interested in the general ideas. Uh, he, he never really liked to go that far into that because, because it was really more detailed than what he was really concerned with. Uh, I mean, it was one of those things that was always in the back of his mind, uh, but there were never things that really brought it up very much. Question. Yes. Okay. Thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk. My question is, um, in Shannon Strick's, the importance of intuitive understanding has been stressed quite a lot. No, now, yeah. my question is, how do you see the relationship between lack of training and intuition? Because sometimes the training component can act like a kind of toolbox where mm -hmm. you have various components and the permutation and combinations of how you arrange those components lead to maybe your own intuitive understanding about a problem. Mm -hmm. So if someone say for example Bull, if he did not have any formal training but he had intuition. So mm -hmm. how do you see, I mean, this relationship between intuition and lack of training or over training? Uh, <laughs> only with great difficulty. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, I, th I think the easiest thing to say about it uh, is that Bull was not untrained. Uh, he spent a great deal of time reading on his own uh, and did a, uh, 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 so in fact he was a highly disciplined person who, uh, who worked very hard at knowing lots of things and building up this this general feeling. Let me put it this way, which might, which might make sense to you. Uh, a person who thinks intuitively, you could think of a little bit as somebody who thinks outside of the box in this crazy notion we have of, of if you want to do something highly creative, you ought to get outside of the box. Really, uh, you, can't, you can't do anything useful outside the box. You have to start in the box go out of the box, go back in the box, go out of the box. It's this process that Whitehead was talking about. Uh, and that's where intuition and training come in too because the two of them reinforce each other. So you have to use both. Thank you again. And uh, we shall see you upstairs, <laughs> building 36, 64. Thanks again, Bob. Thank